welcome to this discussion, uh, a crisis of compassion, who cares? So if that's not the discussion you've come to, <laughs> anyway, I know you all want to be here. So my name is Breach Hare and I'm going to chair this session. I'm a committee member of the Battle of Ideas on a, on a volunteer basis, but I work uh, in a charity as a fundraiser. But I, and I've spent pretty much 30 years working in the health service, many of them in, as a nurse. So it's a session that obviously interests me a lot. The session itself was conceived um, in recognition of the fact that there are real, real problems we've identified in regard to the poor quality of care that vulnerable people, sick, elderly and disabled, receive from parts of the NHS and the private sector. You probably remember that this kicked off very publicly uh, about three years ago when there was a nurse called Margaret Haywood. She was struck off the nursing register for secretly filming neglect and mistreatment of elderly patients in a Brighton hospital. And she resorted to that underhand approach because she'd not had a, any kind of a positive response when she tried to draw attention to the poor care that she was witnessing. Then we, all, we had the Salford Hospital um, uh, farce, no, that's not fair. Yeah, but there's chaotic systems were uh, revealed there, and the fallout from that still reverberates. Then we had that horrific panorama expose about Winterbourne, where vulnerable people were exposed to teasing, taunting, kicking, poking, slapping, dousing with cold water, pouring more mouthwash over a head and into eyes, forcing wet wipes into mouths. <coughs> headbutting, leading to a broken nose, etc. And 11 members of staff have been found guilty and they're going to be uh, sentencing for them starts next week. And many of you would have read Christina Patterson, who's here on my left, her articles in The Independent about her care or lack of it when she was a patient in hospital. And there's, there's ongoing scandals um, that you'll be familiar with. Um, and we had the dehydration scandal where the patient had to ring the police to say that he couldn't get a drink of water. <coughs> Nobody was looking after him. So nursing in general uh, has been tried and found wanting. We've been accused of being uncaring and too posh to wash. And as a consequence, whistleblowing, undercover reporting and film filming are all too commonplace in care settings. And all sorts of solutions, technical, educational, regulatory, have been suggested that are being implemented in an attempt to address this crisis of care. And this week, the government announced that it's going to spend 46 million during three years from this year, training 10,000 NHS staff, and half of those will be nurses and midwives. And a whistleblower charter has just been launched. But will any of this make any difference? And our panel, who I'll now introduce, will explore the topic that I've just outlined. They have a maximum of six minutes to make their initial points. And I'll keep them strictly to time, because as you probably know by now, we're on a tight schedule. You have to move from one room to another very quickly. And we don't want to overrun and cut into somebody else's time. So, um, I introduce the speakers now in the order that they'll speak. So on my left, far left, is Christina Patterson. She's a writer and columnist at The Independent. She writes about politics, society, culture and the arts. She's a former director of the Poetry Society and Literary Programme at the South Bank Centre. She's written for The Observer, The Sunday Times and The Guardian. She's campaigned to improve standards in nursing, both in a series of articles in The Independent and in a forethought programme she made for Radio 4 last year. And she's currently making another program about nursing for Radio 4 <coughs> to run in November this year. My immediate left is Anne Gallagher, and she's a reader in nursing ethics and editor, nursing ethics, University of Surrey. Anne has had extensive experience as a healthcare ethicist, nurse, educator, researcher, and editor of the international journal Nursing Ethics. You see a flyer about that in your packs. She's a member of a number of ethics committees and the current focus of her research relates to understanding and responding to deficits in care, dignity in care, end-of-life ethics, and research ethics. 
She has published on a wide range of topics in healthcare ethics, such as restraint, whistleblowing, conflicts of interest. And she's an author of a number of books as well. On my immediate right is a Professor Ray Tallis. Ray is Emeritus Professor of Geriatric Medicine at the University of Manchester and was a consultant physician in health of the elderly in Salford until 2006. He's Chair of Healthcare Professionals for Assisted Dying. He's a prolific writer and has over 200 research papers published and he's won loads of prestigious prizes. In 2000, he was elected Fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. That was just his medical career. In his non-medical career, he's published fiction, three volumes of poetry, and 22 books on the philosophy of mind, philosophical anthropology, literary theory, the nature of art, and cultural criticism. He's, uh, in 2008, he was appointed Honorary Visiting Professor in the Department of English at the University of Liverpool. His 2011 book, Aping Mankind, New Romania, Darwinitis and Misrepresentation of Humanity is just out in paperback. And this has been followed by In Defense of Wonder and Other Philosophical Reflections. <coughs> and he'll be signing those books immediately after this session by the Royals <laughs> Bookstore. as a good plug for his book. Thank you. And on my far right is Alka Segal Kutbert. She's a teacher and PhD researcher. Alka has taught and lectured in English, media and cultural studies for 16 years. Having once sworn never to teach or have children, she subsequently decided she'd rather like to do both. Uh, worried about what she regards as an anti-humanistic trend in education, she decided to investigate further by studying for a PhD in philosophy and sociology of education. That's work in progress. She's also on the volunteer team behind the East London Science School, which aims to promote an academic education to all pupils, irrespective of background or ability. She's a member of the Institute of Ideas, Education and Parenting Forum, and writes articles on both subjects for Spiked Online. That's our panel. They'll now um, introduce their, uh, lay out their <coughs> wares, as it were. Don't clap them after they've done it. We'll do all the clapping at the end. Um, because we want to leave as much time as possible to the discussion and for you to join in. After they've done their introduction, we'll have a, a short uh, bit of a discussion here. And then your, it's your opportunity to get involved, to comment, criticize, correct, ask questions, disagree, up to you. We'll have a, a good banter between you and the panel. OK, Christine. Can you hear me? <coughs> Thank you. When I was first diagnosed with breast cancer nine years ago, I was understandably pretty worried. I was worried about the treatment, I was worried that I might have to lose a breast, and I was worried that I might die. But I wasn't worried about the care I'd get. I didn't think you had to worry about the care you'd get. But on the first day when I woke up after my first operation, I realized that I should have. I still had drips and drains and all kinds of things hanging off me, and a nurse told me I had to get up and get my own breakfast. She showed me how to clip them to a kind of trolley, which I could use to control myself to the room with the breakfast. But I'd had all the lymph nodes out from under one arm, and I couldn't lift the teapot. And that was when I realized that nobody cared whether I got a cup of tea or not. During that first hospital stay and the two operations that followed, I learned that it was perfectly normal for nurses to give the impression that they didn't like the patients or their job. When my cancer came back three years ago, I thought things would be better. I'd gone to a different hospital under something called patient choice, and I heard it was a very good hospital. But the morning after my very big operation, I realized that they weren't going to be better. I'd just had a breast removed, I'd had a big chunk of flesh and the blood vessels from my stomach moved <coughs> to the space where the breast had been. A very delicate operation and they have to reconnect, they have to connect the old blood vessels to the ones that are there. And there's a serious danger that it can go black and die. Those blood vessels have to be checked every 15 minutes. When the person who had been doing that through the night disappeared, no one came near me for two and a half hours. When the nurse finally did, she was 
cross and rude, and she had no idea what operation I'd had. She made some serious mistakes. I complained. I was told that nobody seemed to know who was in charge. Later, I heard two nurses bitching about the fact that I'd complained standing at the end of my bed. And I've never, ever felt so abandoned or alone. I was in serious pain, and I was very worried that the operation was going to go, that the, the flesh was going to die. But I was also terrified of the nurses. I'd been told by my surgeon that I mustn't let the bandages, if they got wet, they had to be dried immediately with a hairdryer. And I asked one nurse if she could get me one, and she said she didn't have time to go to the cupboard. Another time, a friend visited me, and the tea trolley didn't stop at my bed, and my friend chased down the ward to stop it, but couldn't catch it in time, and asked the nurse instead, and the nurse told her off. I told her later that she shouldn't ever ask the nurse for a cup of tea, but she didn't realise, she didn't understand the rules. I didn't necessarily expect kindness in hospital, but I really didn't expect cruelty. I didn't expect the women around me, who were all in pain after very serious operations and who all had cancer, to press their buzzers and find that nobody came to answer them. I didn't expect that it would be the patients who were very polite and the nurses who were rude. But that's how it was. And when I wrote about my experiences in The Independent and made a programme last year called Forethought for Radio 4, I had hundreds and hundreds of emails and letters from people saying that they'd had terrible experiences of nursing too. Now we've all heard about the terrible reports, the Mid Staffordshire, the Winterbourne View panorama, Age UK, the Ombudsman, there are endless, endless patients association, endless reports. And every time they come out, there seems to be a tendency to think that this is a few bad apples. Well, it isn't. I've talked to many, many nurses and doctors and patients, and I think that there is a very, very serious crisis of compassion in this country. It's in the nursing profession, but it's much wider than that. And I think what it all comes down to is culture. It can be the culture of the NHS, the culture of an NHS trust, the culture of a hospital, or a culture of a ward, or of a care home. And it can also be the culture of society. Cultures are set from the top. If you have leaders who aren't compassionate, and you don't care about the people they employ, then you're very unlikely to find compassion at any point in, a, in an organisation. Now, it's a complicated issue. Some of my fellow panellists have devoted their entire professional lives to it. We're not going to solve it in an hour and a quarter. But I do believe there are many things that can be done. I think people who want to work in caring roles can and should be assessed for their compassion. I think healthcare managers need to make sure that compassion, compassion is at the heart of what they're trying to do and that all staff are held to account when it isn't there. I think there are ways of assessing this stuff which don't just involve tick boxes. And I think compassion can be taught. I've met people who are doing it and who are doing it very well. And if John Lewis can train their staff in empathy, I think hospitals and care homes can too. It isn't easy to do this stuff in a culture which has increasingly emphasised the individual. I think it's very hard to turn a tide, but I do think it can be done. But if you want it to be done, we'll have to decide that we want, as a society, to be a society that cares more and we need to play our part in making sure we do. Perfect timing, thank you. And be that. The late Claire Rayner, herself a nurse, in one of the reports Christina mentioned, said that bad, cruel nurses need to be struck off the professional register. And no doubt everyone here would agree with that. However, the possible causes and cure of what some have characterised as an epidemic of unethical practice needs to go beyond individuals. And I want to take an approach where I want to talk to you about some of the people I work with. And let's start with Owen. Owen is a third year student nurse who had a previous career as an engineer. He was working with the staff nurse Sarah in the emergency department when an elderly patient, Ms. Walker Lily, was admitted. After investigations, it became clear 
that Lily's care had to be palliative. There was no, no possible treatment. When asked what she would like to eat or drink, Lily reminisced about holidays at the seaside and said she would really like a soft ice cream. The hospital ice cream machine had broken down and Owen agreed with Sarah that he would drive to the local McDonald's at the end of the shift. He returned with an ice cream and Lily's friend helped her to have this. Lily died some hours later. Such small acts of kindness are not unusual in the NHS and they need to be acknowledged and celebrated. Another example. Martha is a senior nurse at another local hospital. We'd been talking about a piece I'd written on the theme of slow ethics. She emailed me late, later and she said, we are all so bombarded every day, all day, with information, with demands upon our time, that the opportunity for quiet reflection becomes eroded. Coupled with the quantity of information comes demand to get everything done quickly and finesse is lost. Because we're sadly looking for the quick fix, the quick reply, the shortcut, and everyone is under so much pressure, so taking time is a luxury. There are many colleagues whose work in professional education and nursing ethics I'd like to tell you about, but clearly I can only really talk about a few. One colleague in our university has initiated a process to support students when the concerns they raise about care practices need to be escalated. She told me that in her experience, there's a positive correlation between the academic ability of our students and their performance in practice, that means in a good way. Smarter students generally practice very well. Another colleague who teaches physical assessment skills reminded me of the high level of knowledge, skill, and ethical sensitivity required to engage in what an observer might consider a mundane task, such as taking an older person to the toilet. Another teacher colleague brings together students from our drama school and student nurses to role play and reflect on practice situations and to rehearse ethical responses. Teachers, including myself, also use accounts and reports of unethical practice, such as Christina's Radio 4 program, Care to Be a Nurse. And we also use reports from the Patients Association, the Health Service Ombudsman, and the Care Quality Commission to keep students close to the patient and family experience, enabling them to recognize the impact of their actions and omissions and to consider how such practices can be understood and avoided. The journal Nursing Ethics, which is now in its 19th year, and as editor I'm privileged to have the perspective of nurse researchers and teachers from around the world. There were 200 participants at our recent Nursing Ethics Conference from 28 countries. The conference theme was Overcoming Challenges to Ethical Care. Researchers uh, reported the findings from projects where they explored the experiences of older people in care, their relatives, and the staff who work with them. They also analyzed concepts such as dignity, respect, compassion, wisdom, and courage. Other research relates to staff experience of moral distress in circumstances where they know the right thing to do, but they feel unable to do it, generally because of organizational constraints. Some researchers have also examined the relationship between moral distress and the ethical climate of healthcare organisations. You won't be surprised to learn that the better the ethical climate of the healthcare organisation, the less moral distress nurses and other health professionals will experience. <coughs> In relation to the, the topic of this uh, session, one definition of crisis refers to a turning point in a disease when, a, when an important change takes place. And my hope is that by working together, this change will be towards mm. recovery. By way of conclusion, I want to make three points. First, care work is complex, challenging, and ever-changing. Nurses and other, and other professionals need to hold firm to professional values when these are challenged by organizational values that prioritize financial targets over patient experience, and societal values that diminish older people and older disabilities. Secondly, I want to reassure you that we are on our case. And we don't know all the answers, that's for sure. Explanations for uncaring practices require an understanding not just of individuals, but also of organizations and the wider societal and political context. Single concepts, not even compassion, single concepts and simple solutions will not do. We do not need additional ethical guidelines. We do not need additional pledges or manifestos, but rather bottom-up approaches with values-based leadership to sustain ethical practices from the bedside to the boardroom and beyond. 
Nursing Research, Education and UK initiatives by the Royal College of Nursing and the Department of Health are currently actively engaged with the complexity of ethical and unethical practice. Finally, I have to say, it is both a privilege and a responsibility to be a nurse, caring for people when they're at their most vulnerable. But in a culture where care is devalued and care work is considered low status, perhaps even seen as women's work that anyone can do, and where there is little supporting, sorry, there's little reporting of the value of nursing, it seems unlikely that the brightest <coughs> and the best of our young and indeed our older people will consider this as a viable career option. It is in all of our interests that they do. Thank you. Ray. Well, thank you, and I'm very glad to participate in the session. I'm very cheered that we've actually got a capacity crowd, which shows that, in fact, people really are concerned about this. Um, and the stories of both beggar belief and are extraordinarily familiar, aren't they? Of hospital patients being starved because they can't feed themselves, becoming dehydrated because nobody thought to help them to drink, or could be bothered to do so, or are left to rot in soiled or dirty clothes, and are not bathed and they're denied pain relief. And families who try to make up for these terrible shortcomings in care are often actively unwelcome, and they're excluded from decisions uh, about discharge. So how should we respond to these dreadful and dreadfully familiar stories. Now one wrong response, it seems to me, is to minimise their significance and to reassure ourselves that most patients get treated well, or at least adequately. This defence won't wash. Would we feel relaxed about unnecessary deaths in police custody because most police <coughs> do a good job? Besides the stories, and I think it's come from what the, the, my two, the two previous panellists, these stories illustrate a wider picture of neglect that many organisations, including the Patients Association, have flagged up repeatedly. Now, another wrong response is to see this as a nail in the coffin of the NHS, and indeed of the very idea of a universal healthcare system free of the point of need, funded out of taxes, and directed and regulated to some degree centrally. Now, on this issue, those impressive patient satisfaction surveys are relevant. I don't think it's the NHS that's the problem, the NHS is not broken. And anyone who thinks the answer lies in opening up healthcare provision more widely to the private sector should be reminded that abuse of older people is very well documented in that sector, notably in private care homes. Bringing in providers more explicitly motivated by profit is less likely to improve care for the most vulnerable and financially least attractive clients. It's more likely to divert taxes to organisations whose interest in health is motivated primarily by the promise of rich pickings. And this relates to something else, that the importation of a business ethos or a business model into the NHS in the name of efficiency and the worship of throughput may itself have contributed to downgrading the importance of things that matter but can't be measured. An hour spent comforting a terrified, confused patient does not do much for the health of the balance sheet unless it can be separately invoiced. There's been much talk of private sector values, but the assumption that only that which can be counted truly counts, and the narrowing of accountability to accountability would only further promote decline in standards of care. Now, the usual response to scandal is to throw an, an inquiry at the relevant institution, and with some exceptions, the track record of inquiries is dire. They're often worse than useless because they prescribe procedural, bureaucratic, and legalistic answers to problems that lie elsewhere. Typically, they make vast numbers of recommendations, usually described as rafts or whole rafts of proposals, as if the success of an inquiry were measured by the quantity of its recommendations. These translate in practice into boxes to be ticked, documenting that certain procedures have been gone through, certain steps have been taken, and that these have been communicated, and that that communication itself has been documented. Every box that has to be ticked carries an opportunity cost. The exigencies of the computer screen compete with actual care, distracting health professionals from the needs of their patients. Each datum enter entered may be a kindness or gone. So we can't fill a hole in basic humanity by regulating care more closely. Nor can it be filled with more training, the other solution that's so often invoked. Training in what, for God's sake? In things that a four-year-old would understand? Training that older people need to eat and drink? Learning that sitting in a puddle of urine is not pleasant? All of these things seem to be unlikely to deliver what's needed. What is needed is clearly reflection on the pressures on the permissions, on the attitudes and the priorities that have made mistreating some patients 
so acceptable that it can even take place in broad daylight. Genuine soul-searching and not just measures, procedures and really beady-eyed scrutiny with clipboards is necessary. The simple question, how did we behave so horribly to this person, for example to Christina? That surely must be a good place to start. A childish question, but that's where you must start. The answers will usually be complex and beyond the usual scope of inquiries. And any process of reflection should focus not only on places where things have gone spectacularly wrong, but onto other places where shortcomings are real but less headline grabbing. And it will be equally important to learn from those many places where excellent care is given. And reflection should look beyond healthcare institutions. They are, after all, a microcosm of society at large, and their values mirror society's values. Devaluation of those unglamorous but supremely human and invaluable activities, such as hands on care of elderly people, is the other side of the overvaluation of empty glamour. Just to wind up, I feel that the NHS and other healthcare institutions should be proud of the care given to most people, but deeply ashamed of the maltreatment of others. We are all of us part of the NHS, and all of us in our different ways contribute to creating the context in which it operates and so shaping its record. That's why we mustn't allow our response to these kinds of outrages to be confined to self-indulgent rage or a call for more regulation of those who will care for us in our hours of greatest need mm -hmm. and greatest vulnerability. Thanks, Ray. And Alka. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me at the back? Thanks, Ray. Um, okay, I just want to um, outline what I think <coughs> some of the... Uh, Cultural, the wider cultural factors that are leading to this kind of casual callousness that we see, not just in health, um, but I think across all the liberal professions. Um, as you really said, my background is in education. I did actually do six months nurse training, and it was a blessing to the nursing profession that I left. I'm not sure I would do that. But, um, uh, however, so, and I think it's important not just to sort of academically understand the cultural context, but because obviously, Ray, you're back me up here, the diagnosis will affect the, uh, the prognosis, the cure, the whatever you prescribe. So I think one of the key things here is, if, let's look at the question of professional autonomy. We look at the liberal professions that developed, on the, by liberal professions I mean teaching, medicine, um, there's most caring, care work, Possibly, I don't know about journalism, I'm not sure about that, but let's just stick with um, these two for now. They developed at a particular historical time, and they developed with a relatively high degree of autonomy. They had their own institutions, codes of practices, ideas, values, criteria for progress, and generally, you know, were fair, had a, a high level of autonomy. Now, that included some negative things. It could include, you know, unquestioned deference. It could include, you know, kind of various um, aspects of corruption. But it did also include a respect and an understanding of humane learning, of proper knowledge, and of care. So there were two aspects to that. Now, um, uh, that I think generally has gone, or is it has all but gone. Um, where it exists, it exists in spite of, rather than because of what's happening. Um, I, I think the, a kind of main turning point in the liberal professions was, was the 80s. It was a, a political reconfiguration of uh, professional institutions and the government, where lots, you know, there was a kind of uh, twinned, twinned attack in the name of neoliberal market measures that were actually really only the state reconfigured in different forms. Um, and new kind of centres of authority, new practices, new codes of behaviour, new criteria, new professional relationships and new centres of accountability were set up. Um, and the, the kind of buzzwords of that time that are still with us are flexibility and train, trainability and such like a nurse or a teacher or a care worker will, will recognise those. Um, and they have become the kind of, um, you know, the, got the hallmarks of success. And I think this, in a way, this kind of accounts for a kind of the devaluing of older experience and the devaluing of older knowledge. Because in this kind of reconfiguration, what was old, the old centres of loyalty, the old centres of 
professional trust were dislodged. And that had that, had that kind of, there was a consequence of setting up these new ones. And a, an effect of that is a kind of divorce um, in the professional from your inner commitment, your inner loyalty, from the more outwardly technical things that you do. And you can see across the professions we've had more and more, you know, there's a whole load of researchers and research studies being set up that are replying, you know, we used to work with a business ethic way, you know, kind of they're replying a technical functionalist analysis that comes from a particular form of industry, uh, of industrial manufacture, to professions where it really doesn't apply, it doesn't belong. Not only does it not belong, but it actually um, corrodes the, the, the human substance of those professions because it focuses on technique and then the human work becomes invisible. You know, that hour spent talking to the old lady to find out the gold ring she's fretting about symbolises 40 years of her life with her husband and family. It doesn't happen, and when it does happen, it isn't valued. <clears throat> so this kind of reduction of the profession to, their, to the most technical aspects makes people flexible. If they're flexible, they're interchangeable. If you're interchangeable, you don't matter. Now that I, I, that's I think that kind of con that's the kind of context I think, which is which I think gives rise to that kind of treatment you have experienced, Christine, rather than a vindictive, de de you know, desperate maliciousness, because you know under that kind of onslaught, day in and day out, subject to that criteria, with nobody else offering any other kind of version of a professional ideal or a professional goal, you kind of there's a, a limited range of options. You know, you can have conversion. You can have people who suddenly get really eager-eyed about all this stuff and go on around manically, you know, going in for the checklist things. Quite often, I'm not going to risk generalising here, but quite often it's a generational thing. Younger people who have not known any different, who have just been educated in that um, culture, are, are kind of quite gung-ho about it. <clears throat> or you get burnout. And the problem of recruitment and retention in both professions is, is known. Or you get a less disgusting, thing, which is what I call a motivation. Um, it's not demotivation, it's a motivation. And it comes from research being done in, in effects of, in, in education. Um, and what, what it's characterised by is when people no longer feel a sense of connection between their inner will and what they do whether what they do is either it can be approved of or it can be disapproved of, it doesn't matter either way. Either way they feel no kind of connection to it. And that kind of leads to what I think is a restricted professionalism. Because if all your, if all your kind of, if everything around you is just reinforcing this idea that this job means doing this, this is what, impo this is, what is important, this is what we look for, this is what we measure, then you tend to just do that bit of your job. You tend to just do the logging in and not checking out if that's then taken further and handed over to the right person. You don't see your work as part of an ongoing tradition or a practice as a whole. Okay, so that's that. Oh, sorry, I didn't give you a minute. Can I just quickly, I've got to go. Very, very quickly. Another really important, um, the, the, cult, this, the cultural shift, um, that links in with this and fuels this is that we have a negative conception of the individual and what that means for moral behaviour. Very quickly, very simply, if you see human beings as essentially spontaneously moral, then you'll have no problem with autonomy. You'll let people, you'll assume that if they've done their course, they've done the training, they've got the cognitive intellectual capacity for their profession, you let them get on with it. That sphere has to be autonomous, otherwise you can't have moral behaviour. If you see human beings as negative, as if you lived on their own, they're going to be immoral or they're going to be horrible or cruel, then moral behaviour can only come about if you regulate it, if you intervene, which is what we're seeing. And my argument is, which I don't think you can teach compassion, is that because to be truly moral, it has to be done autonomously and it has to be in a directed, directed to an individual directly, not to any third party. So. Thank you very much. Okay, before I invite you to join in the discussion, I'd be quite interested now to just get your immediate thoughts on what your colleagues have said, because Alka has directly criti criti criticised, well, contradicted what you said, Christina. <laughs> you could say that. Um, well, she, 
Um, in the you, you said that people need to be assessed for compassion yeah. and that compassion yeah. can't be taught. Yeah. Yeah. So what do yeah. you think? Well, um, I obviously disagree with you and I stand by what I said a few minutes ago. But, um, thank you. I think that, for example, you talked about um, bad or cruel behaviour as very often a consequence of excessive regulation or tick boxes or accountability or whatever, and it certainly can be. But I don't think those staff at Winterbourne were being tick boxed or regulated or held to account in any way at all. I think that doesn't allow for the fact that we absolutely all have the ability within us to behave extremely badly and to behave extremely well. And you know, we all don't know how we would have behaved in Nazi Germany, and we all don't know how we would have behaved if we were a junior care assistant at Winterbourne with a boss who was an absolute bully. I mean, it ties in with, um, tomorrow I'm speaking on a panel about the Leveson Inquiry. And newspapers are bullying places. You know, I work for a sort of centre-left, relatively nice one. It's not a picnic, I can tell you. And um, News of the World would definitely not have been a picnic. Winterbourne View would definitely not have been a picnic. So on that front, I think, I think you have to allow for the fact that it's not whether people choose spontaneously to be moral or immoral, but we all have the capacity to be both. But the response to the Cambridge <coughs> compassion thing well, I don't know whether you call it compassion, but you can certainly teach effective communication. There seems to be quite a lot of evidence that you can help people get better at empathy. John Lewis can do it. I don't see why hospitals can't do it if John Lewis can do it. And I think in terms of, um, I've just forgotten what I was going to say. Oh dear, how annoying. Um, the teaching compassion, assessing for compassion, yeah. I think, I think, I think you can. I think you know there are personality tests you can do. There are questionnaires that will give some indication of whether people have any idea of <coughs> make, how to make that imaginative leap to be to enter into someone else's shoes. I think that is an absolutely fundamental part of this whole thing. And I think a lot of children aren't growing up with that nowadays for all kinds of complicated cultural reasons. It might be difficult to get that <coughs> right, but it's certainly not impossible. And you know, you just have to ask people to make that imaginative leap. I could talk all day, so I think yeah, you have lovely. lots of time. Okay. Yeah. And um, can I just check with you because you you talked what well, you said, and I'm not sure if you meant this that that smarter people, you know, obviously they study well because they're smarter. But are you saying it's the caliber of nurses that there there are lower quality, lower caliber people being recruited? Um, and if if that's the case. Is that the case? That nursing is not attracting the right kind of people? No, I was not saying that. All right. <laughs> um, I was anticipating, I guess, an attack about the move to graduate nurses. And um, <laughs> this is, a, as you probably know, this is quite momentous. Just this month, we now have an all graduate profession in England. Prior to this, we had diploma and degree students. And there's a lot of debate about this. And the business of being a nurse is very complex. And I would in initially say compassion is not enough. Um, I mean, I'm a big fan of virtue ethics, and I think nurses, good nurses need a wide range of moral qualities, <coughs> and also intellectual qualities. I'm very sympathetic to Ray's point about reflection. That is absolutely crucial that we reflect on ourselves, we reflect on colleagues' behavior, and we're able to give feedback. So I think generally, I mean, the standards are definitely um, up in the, in, in the light of recruiting people for a graduate profession, and I'd be very optimistic, but it's not easy. I mean, Christina pointed to the issue about assessing for compassion. I mean, my immediate response is not everything that matters can be measured. This is a very complex activity. And sometimes our students, I mean, those students I work with, they're just very, very impressive young people. And what I continue to hear is something happens. It may be that some of them, of course, there are aspects to them I don't see and I don't know about, but something happens when they go into practice. Yeah. Yeah. And the word uh, of moral erosion comes to me. And that's why I think it's not just about bad apples in good barrels, and it's not even as simple as good apples and bad barrels, but I think the interrelationship between individuals, organizations, and the values in societies, and we have to hold on with that. So it's a very complex business. But generally, I have to say, I feel very optimistic based on the students I see at my university. Ray, you were keen to get back on what Christine was talking about. Yes, I mean, first of all, I, I'm not confident we can actually assess compassion as a being 
the mission team in medical school for many years, I could see people could tell a very good story. And they tell fantastic stories and so on. How those stories panned out in situations of great pressure will be another matter altogether. And I can see how them further down the track as I practice as a doctor. You're absolutely right that um, in somewhere like Winterbourne, how well would we, any of us in the panel, be able to We look pretty good up here now because we're not under any kind of pressure at all. And I'm not completely convinced that I would be very well behaved myself. I don't know, uh, under those kind of pressures. It's the pressure of a total institution, the kind of thing that Goffman spoke about in asylums and so on. And it's hardly surprising that that uh, isolated uh, facility uh, has some terrible, terrible uh, behavior. But you gave the example of John Lewis. Nobody in John Lewis is under anything comparable to the pressure that anybody is nursing for a desperate ill patient. They're not, but dealing with the public all day is not particularly easy. You know, people, members of the public are often pretty rude to people they, they regard as, um, you know, doing a not particularly prestigious job. Um, we saw the Osborne thing on the train yesterday. Osborne was not personally rude to anyone, but there was a widespread perception that that there was a class aspect there, which there may, may well not have been personally, yeah. I think it was a bit of a twist. I, mean, I won't get too delayed in that, but just point out, I can't remember when I last went into John Lewis and had to have my bottom wiped, or to be cared for in a very intimate and stressful way, nor had a drip put up, nor did, did I, you know, uh, it's a completely different situation. So I've I, I put that on the brackets, it just simply isn't the same, because I've you know, seen different situations. But looking at the bigger picture, and I think, I mean, I very much resonate with what Arthur is saying. Mm -hmm. I think the bigger picture is in professions, we move from a covenant to a contract. The idea that the professional uh, deal with the patient, whatever, was a very open, uh, virtue-based, uh, ethics-based, vocational-based relationship. It has become increasingly a narrowly defined contractual thing. And one manifestation of that is, of course, the tick box culture, measuring performance, measuring output. So much so that individual professionals are becoming increasingly merely sessional functionaries, rather than people who had a broader uh, commitment to you know, making the welfare of those around them uh, better. And I think that is part of an increasingly bureaucratized society, a society that is also regulated increasingly in response to appropriate increased expectations of those around them. But it does lead to a kind of arms race, as it were an almost adversarial situation between not the patient and the nurse or the patient and the doctor, but between the client and the provider, where both parties, as it were, are um, potentially in an adversarial situation. So I think there are big things happening. And although, of course, we need to focus on compassion ultimately, I think compassion itself is very much situation culture and context dependent, as well as being individual, a matter of individual responsibility. Okay, you look like you're biting your back. <laughs> well, I suppose, um, I would also stand on what I said, I don't think compassion can be made. I think it's worth thinking of the professions as having three sort of aspects to it. Um, you know, you have, you have, there's a kind of, whether you're a teacher or, a, or you work in the, the health profession, there's going to be, if you like, an intellectual base, a cognitive base, and a kind of soft skills, the communication things, you know, or, you know, how, you know, I've had an awful experience of trying to take somebody's life really or horribly, it went awfully wrong, and she was so kind. But, you know, I could have done with more skills training on that, I'm sure. So there's that. And then there's kind of, you know, professional procedures and things. But, and, and those are areas that I think it is legitimate where you can kind of, you know, improve, rational, apply your rational thought and knowledge and all the rest of it improve upon. But there's that very important sphere that I'm talking about and I think we really need to maintain, which is the sphere of putting that into practice. And that has to re re remain autonomous because the more you interfere in that, right, the thing about being a moral act, right, is that it imply you have to accept there's going to be a certain risk in it. Because that's the basis for a moral act, whether that moral act is good or bad. As you said, we can we'll all be good or bad. So you've got to accept that kind of risk. Now, if you're trying to constantly minimise and encroach upon that, you're actually eroding the very basis for somebody to be moral. So that sounding a bit... Anyway, I'll try and come back a bit more to concrete things. So I think it's so... So I'm not against saying you can't improve things in nursing or healthcare or teaching. 
but that we have to think very carefully what is the nature of it, that what is the nature of what we're trying to improve. Because if we get it wrong, we'll end up making the problem worse, which is what I think we're doing at the moment. Um, I think there's a, there's, there's a kind of, the, people always say that, oh well, all these technical things, they're reducing the time, they don't have the effort, we're having to waste our time with paper thinning. And that is true for teachers and for nurses. There is an actual reduced amount of time and effort available. And especially when, when you do put go the extra mile, you're then told that you have time management issues rather than, you know, that's the kind of, obviously that is not going to kind of make you fit, have any kind of um, expansive or want to extend your professionalism. Instead it shrinks, it tends to shrink you. And I think it shrinks you in two ways. It, it tends to exert pressure on you to do as little as possible. Not because you're lazy, but because the more you do, the more basically you're laying yourself on the line to be told that you need time management training. And, more, and it also reduces the imagination. There's a moral, a, a kind of reduction in the moral imagination, where our kind of circle of imagined in, of interests of people who we feel connected to in some way. It's not just our immediate family, it's not just our friends, not just even people in our neighbourhood, but just to imagine us as a bigger, wider community shrinks a bit. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. You can see that we could discuss this for the next hour, but you're here and you're as important part of this discussion. So, can I have the people with the mics? Where are you? And there's someone right at the very back behind you. Bloke at the back waving his hand. Can you stand up and shout? Sorry. Can I just say, sorry, before we really honestly don't want anecdotal stories. Oh, no, I'm just saying, I'm just saying basically, you know, strongly about Love it. Love it. Yeah, yeah. No, it wasn't getting into that. No interest in business today. No, but basically, I do feel it's very strong, and I think the parallels made to the customer service world um, is very strong because, you know, you've got these people who have to show compassion. I've been a customer service manager for five years now. And even though you can't do, like the lady on the end says, you can't say, smile or tick, be nice, tick, ask anyone about their they tick. I think the way to go through it is to learn an example. Mm -hmm. And what the second lady in long said about the gentleman to the ice cream and stuff like that, when you get young people in the service world, the only way they learn from serving good customer service is to watch good examples of it. So yes, you can't teach it, but it will just become more mediocre and tedious if you go, you have to be pleasant to someone getting a cup of tea like this, you need to be pleasant to a patient like that. If you learn from good examples and you learn from good examples and then also um, over rewarding the uh, good the good service and making that known across the profession and across the nation, I mean that's probably the way to get around it rather than put more checklists in place, I think. There's a reason why I'm not going to be well as well because they appreciate it. Okay, there's a woman here with the green coat and white scarf, and then the woman in white, parallel. Thank you. Um, I'd like the panel to consider whether the issue is not more historical, because I think with the setup of institutions which took over from immediate families, you actually have suddenly a move of compassion to a different level. So whereas the compassion might have been on a familiar basis where you cared for your loved ones, you suddenly uh, operating within an institution where you have to be compassionate to somebody you don't know anything about. And therefore, I think maybe the, the issue is historical. We've never learned uh, in the first place to be compassionate. It's now that we are more, we've got higher standards now, and we beginning to see some of the practices that perhaps were there before, but we didn't talk about them. Okay, the woman in white. Um, I think it's, uh, it's very interesting what everyone has been saying, but I think there also needs to be a discussion about the kind of context in which this has happened and the kind of the deep commercialization of the concept of baby motivation has occurred in. Hospital medicine has changed significantly in the last 20 years in terms of both the numbers coming through the door and also the breakdown of the old firm structure that has arisen from the introduction of the European Working Time Directive that has um, led us to working 48 hour weeks. So going back to the point that was made at the back, um, where we learned from example, and we learned in a firm structure with the consultant registrar and the junior, that has dissipated and been replaced by a shift system in which there's actually very little feedback from what you have done, because you work as an individual unit, 
um, and you often don't see the results of the decisions that you have made or the consequences of your action. And therefore, in this situation, it's very difficult to suggest the kind of concept of professionalisation because that, um, that concept has been consistently eroded. So that the job that was once, such as nursing and doctoring and teaching, that was held in such high regard, has been reduced to shift work and shift pattern and the individual, the individual without that wider sphere of understanding. Thank you. We'll take one more from this book here and then hold on to your questions because I'll just get some comments from the panel first. Um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for the debate because I think it's really interesting and I just want to agree with what, what the last two speakers have said. Um, so I, I'm a medical student currently and um, there is, say for instance, we're taught in communication skills some of which is quite useful. So for instance, if you're talking to a patient, start with open questions, get them to explain what's happening with them, then move to <coughs> closed questions. And you know, so it's a kind of technical way of how to talk to someone. But some of it's also, not to put too far point in it, it's kind of, you talk to people like a person, but they go, oh, you're, you're mirroring their behavior very well. And it kind of like, I wasn't intending to do that. That's just how, how I talk. And it's kind of, you can imagine that this sort of tick box mentality moving more towards that aspect rather than the, the kind of, um, the sort of, uh, the, it's, it's uh, learning at the, at the hands of someone else, just observing what um, more senior people do um, is, is the way to learn it. Um, and also, yeah, just to kind of throw in what the point about the European Working Time Directive, you, medicine is kind of becoming this nine to five job whilst nursing is taking on a lot of aspects of how medicine used to be, so for instance, as a nurse practitioner, so I was wondering what the, the panel thought about that. Okay, can I have some comments now from the panel? Christine, do you want to look back with um, Yes. Well, first of all, to the guy at the back who talked about customer service, I thought that was a very, very really interesting point, and to me, I mean, what this all comes down to really is leadership, actually, whether it's leadership on a, on a hospital ward, that's the ward manager, sister in a hospital, it's the matron in a care home, it's the person running the care home. And I absolutely agree that it all comes down to example. And I think that if you have the people high up, closely involved with care at every level, so the chief executive of the trust, our board members of the trust, <coughs> regularly wandering around the wards, talking to the patients, asking them about their, their, their care, mm -hmm. and also fostering good more importantly perhaps, and this ties in with what you were saying, fostering good relationships with their colleagues and staff. Personally, I think happy people are much, much better at doing anything better, but particularly caring for people better. Unhappy people are the worst people in the world to care for people. They shouldn't be allowed to do it. And the NHS is tragically full of very unhappy people. And that isn't their fault. It is actually probably their manager's fault, and I'm sure it's the fault of all of these systems and tick boxes that are endlessly introduced. But I do believe that good leaders find ways around this, and they find ways to bring out the, the best in the people who are working with them and for them, and they find ways around the tick box culture. And I think it all comes down to leadership. Okay, I agree with I absolutely agree. Leadership is key, and role modeling was the expression used by our colleague at the back. Um, these are crucial and they come up over and over again as the leader who sets the culture. How do young professionals learn? Students, we don't get feedback. Of course, you look to senior colleagues, but we need space and time built into our everyday practice to have dialogue with our more junior colleagues so that we can get feedback. And sometimes senior colleagues need feedback too, because often they're not doing good and right. And we need to be accustomed to receiving feedback. And um, the issue about uh, John Lewis and customer care is, is very interesting. Uh, and of course, patients should have at least minimally customer care services. But I would uh, agree with Ray's point that when you're dealing with people who are very vulnerable and suffering, and dealing with the complexity of family situation, which relates to the question here, the historical point about family care moving into institutions, we need more than a John Lewis model. We need people with a very high level of skill and experience to respond appropriately. I have um, quite a many nurses from different cultures, and I was interviewing a nurse recently from another culture, and she was just uh, amazed at what she called our dysfunctional families, and how, as a staff nurse in an ITU, 
uh, you know, she had to negotiate some of the complexity of these family disagreements. So society has changed. But I think we have to ask the question, what, how do some areas get it right? We rarely hear complaints, for example, from hospice care. There's something about the acute sector. It's a lot about speed. It's a lot about flow and targets. So I think, and I don't think it's just because of all the good nurses go to hospice care. So I think we have to ask questions about context. Right. I mean, I very much like to follow the thread that's been picked up by the two medics, I think, it sounds like if you're both medics, which is about learning from example and the complete destruction of the team. Um, and I think that is very important, that there is absolutely no continuity of care of patients and there's no continuity of leadership for juniors. I mean, I, when I set out as a doctor in 1970, okay, I was on a 104-hour week and I would never, ever want to go back, anybody to go back to that. But you knew who the boss was, and you knew the ward cleaner who would be the most your big confidant, you know, who would be, uh, and the ward sister knew more about everything than you did, and there was a very, very <coughs> coherent team. Uh, and you were supported as well, as slightly bullied, I hasten to add, but no, anyway, you did feel as if you were part of a team, and when something went wrong, you knew who to turn to, and so on. And I think this is part of fragmenting care into sessions of, of, of people who deliver a certain function. I wrote a book about it, a scream of rage called Hippocratic Oaths, which was my farewell to arms when I gave up medicine. But it has happened. And it is interesting that in, in, in many ways it's going to happen more. Uh, if, certainly if Mr. Lansley's bill gets through, it's going to absolutely atomize what we have. And that is extraordinary dangerous for building up team ethos, building up the leadership that Christina referred to, learning from example, include learning from that example, the thing I'm not going to do behave like that. I mean, I learned as much from the bad examples of the consultants I work for as from the good examples, because it disgusted me a bit. So I think that that, that that is a systemic and structural thing that we need to think about. And it reflects what's more broadly happening in society, which is the atomization of our function and the removal from a largely implicit covenantal relationship to each other to a more narrowly contractual one. And that, for my final way, relates to the lady in the green who said, you know, in the past, uh, we had to do this very intimate care for people, as it were, in our immediate vicinity. We now have to behave as if we love people who are complete and total strangers. We have the so-called corporeal works of mercy. We have to, of course, uh, as it were, enact on people whom we do not know, who are often uh, a part of a huge influx of patients. Having said that, there are places where it works really well, which is, you know, and I think we can learn as much about looking at places where things work well as by beating our breasts over things where things have gone horribly wrong, as the kind of experience Christina had. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm just reminded of the, um, was it Blanche Dubois? I've always depended on the kindness of strangers. Because yeah. we are, you know, this thing about, um, so I don't think you have to be happy. I don't think you have to be happy, or even necessarily, you know, sort of, nice, cuddly person. Um, that, that's very much the kind of thinking today, is that to, to do a certain job you have to be a certain type of person. But you see, I think that's a consequence of the kind of corrosion that's gone on within the professional sphere and all the disruption and fragmentation. Because the idea was in the past that, you know, when, when, as a teacher, when you step out, and you're, you know, there's no way as a teacher I'm going to love every one of the 30 or 60 kids I'm going to see in a day. No way, and I'm sure as a nurse or a doctor you're not going to personally love every single patient you, 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 you come across and you're not going to want to necessarily wipe everyone's bum that you're going to need to wipe. But the point is, when you joined a profession, you did it out of that covenant, out of that sense of doing, doing something more than just a function. And you're, you were held accountable to and for, you know, for kind of practices and codes and criteria that were governed and worked out within the profession itself. Now, of course, you don't have that. You're being held accountable to sets of criteria that are coming in from all sorts of people. You know, in teaching, teachers are held accountable for what kids eat, whether they're happy, whether they're confident, and somewhere, somewhere very, very low on the bottom of the list, what they actually learn, what they know, right? So there's been this kind of real confusion as to what the actual character and, um, if you like, legitimate nature of, of, of each particular work involves. And probably I think that's happened in, in, in caring as well, because when people talk, you know, it seems to me that if you're ill, what you want is a doctor that really knows their stuff, i.e. The, the ratio between 
the compassion and the intellectual stuff is going to be weighted more in the intellectual side. I want my doctor to know the medicine. I don't really, it would be nice if he talked to me nicely, but I'm not really that bothered. But when I'm recovering, you know, when I, when I did that horrible thing to that poor old lady with her finger, um, you know, pricking her about six times to try and get the blood, and I was in, te I was in tears with, with kind of awfulness and guilt, she was rich and said, don't worry, love, you know, you're gonna, you're, you've got to learn. I, don't, I can't really feel much in my finger anyway, so Oh yeah, yeah. But for, so, so you don't really need that, and the problem with leadership is a problem. Just very quickly, but not perhaps in the way you mean. Because, for example, there's a hospital in London. I won't name it, even if I can remember the name. But they're saying, well, you know, um, we have a problem with the you know toileting on the wards. Patients aren't getting to the loo often enough. I said, right. Well, um, and they, you know, lots of money, research, you know, now watching how things worked and everything. Or oh, we've got sclerosis at the point of implementation, by which they mean ordinary nurses, um, and with sclerosis. And uh, then they said, um, you know, well, we're going to have a, a toileting awareness campaign. And when somebody said, well, why don't you just get who's ever in charge to tell everybody to go and check if everyone needs a loo every hour or two hours? Every time she said that, it, well, that's problematic. Why is that problematic? And it could only be problematic if these people who are supposed to be leaders, for some reason, you know, they, they, they can't, they, they're just unable to actually impose their will. They're really fearful. They think they're trying to be in control all the time, but actually they're backing away from being authoritative in the proper way. And they way shouldn't be in those jobs. They shouldn't be in those jobs. Okay, <laughs> we've got to take another four or five people because we've got about 10 minutes left before the speakers will come back and respond to the questions. So um, there's a woman, two women there on the left. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, at, in the introduction, Breach talked about uh, some of the events that have happened over the last three or four years. I just want to urge a note of caution here that this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, I've been a nurse for over 40 years and I can quote you some of the statistics and the reports and the horrors that have been happening in the past. So I think it's just, it's important, I think all the issues that are being raised are very relevant, but don't let's kid ourselves into thinking that this is something new and awful that's happening. I think the tragedy is that we clearly don't seem to have learned and we are repeating the mistakes of the past and we're coming up with the solutions of the past. And I think if we keep looking at the same problems and coming up with the same solutions, you know, we're back to the role modeling, the leadership, we didn't, there's nothing wrong with them, but they're clearly not working because we've been through them and through them and through them and spent a fortune on leadership in the NHS. Thanks. Can you pass it to the person in front? Um, yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think the idea of sort of teaching compassion to me doesn't make sense because I believe that, um, and you know, going back to the issue of the uh, academic kind of focus now in nursing, um, that it's not the hiring practices that are a problem, it's the culture of nursing, in, not in every discipline, I mean, I just said in palliative care, I think that it's, it's far more focused on, on patient care and care for the sake of caring, um, and it, instead of it being a, a focus on learning compassion, I think what happens is people are hired who are compassionate, people are, go to uh, study nursing and midwifery who are naturally compassionate people and it's taught out of them, I think, to some extent, because the culture in, I mean, I did a lot of work experience in, um, in hospitals and things when I was deciding what I wanted to do, and I found that, you know, there's a whole horde of nurses, at least one of them must have, you know, um, been compassionate to start off with, but they just yeah. don't, they just didn't seem to care anymore because everyone, you know, there's, it's, it was a, um, I think it was an ITU one, and there was an old lady who kept buzzing and they were getting fed up with her and then I, the kind of comments I got, and I think it was just because they have so many targets and so many things that they have to do, this, like you say, tick boxes. I feel like, I felt like on that particular work experience they were drug dispensers okay. <laughs> rather than being actual nurses, and I think that kind of 
idea that it's more about the culture than the, the teaching is it, working for them. All right, can you uh, please keep your comments as short as possible now, so I want to get as many as possible in. There's, uh, sorry, there's a woman in the purple and blue, and then we'll come across to the woman in red, pink. You. Just want to make yep. a couple of points. Um, uh, I think this has, uh, probably there are a number of causes which are contributing to this, and there are lots of good examples as well. But I was thinking, uh, one is what's the motivation of going into a profession? <coughs> and if your motivation going to um, nursing or medical is caring, then you are more likely to uh, carry that and show. And another thing is, isn't that also the presentation of uh, values uh, going down in the society. I mean, I can remember from my, my lifetime, um, 20, 30 years ago, in big joint families, everyone cared for uh, each other in the family more. Nowadays, when we have more nuclear wealth and nuclear, nuclear families, everyone is fighting for, in a way, maximum they can have. For example, we had um, a couple of years ago, or maybe 10 years ago, in family you would have one computer and everyone will share, and now everyone wants to have their own iPad, even in the nuclear family. And yes, all the other points were quite relevant in the sense, if the top cares, that will filter down to the bottom in different ways, in all okay. ways. Okay, we can pass it across. Can the people that have... Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, and that bloke at the back. Okay. Yeah, hi, Mr. Bay from Screen Teaching Compassion and Spontaneous Morality. Fascinating. And from my own experience of working in special needs schools and within very different institutional cultures, spontaneous morality cannot just happen by itself. You have to make it happen, but at the same time, teaching compassion in the same way as you would teach more technical skills brings in a tedium which can actually grind people down so for me it's about culture and it's about um, leadership ensuring that professionals are reflective practitioners by encouraging them for example to come to things like this through having books on the shelf through coaching and mentoring, subscriptions to professional journals, to, to make people feel alive in what they do. That's when you get the best and most caring practice. Okay, there's a book there, two thirds of the way back, yeah. Yeah. So it was at the back, of the hands up. Can Yeah, please. I'm, I'm a student, but I'm just coming out of uh... Uh, basically a job in the NHS, the GP surgery. I used to talk a lot with the nurses about all of this very thing. I, I, I saw sort of carry on from the point that the very left kind of said, that's why I don't even know, and all sort of medical students said. And I kind of think that nursing as a profession has lost its way and it's being diluted in terms of its role. I mean, I think the role of a I mean, nurse is to be a caregiver, and I think that that's become devalued. I mean, you've got nurse practitioners, you've got nurse-led walking centres. I think the NHS has tried to make nurses into cheap mini doctors that are diagnosticians and treatment givers rather than caregivers. I think that's primarily the reason why this is happening. This, you're dealing with a very deep value profession that doesn't have a direction and it's at the bottom of the pile in the NHS. Is it really any wonder that if you've got someone at the bottom of the pile that those, that, that those sort of seeds of cruelty are unfortunately produced. Okay, and there's, this is going to be the last comment from the woman kind of just behind you, the black top. Hi, um, some woman said to me that uh, just remember when someone is unkind to you, they are deeply hurt themselves. Um, a lot of people um, are probably handicapped from being kind and compassionate toward the others. The problem is the current risk and reward system does not recognize fully of the unmeasurable important matters. The obsession of measurable KPIs and also the fact that there is you know, the pressure, the 
and our different professions we all face, there isn't the time and space you change the system to allow us to be the person that we were made to be. And um, the system dehumanizes us. If I was to think from my own experience, I work in the corporate world. I've never had to care for someone or had someone care for me in medical sense. But I work in a corporate environment where there is a lot of pressure. Um, you know, when I get a response of an email from someone with two words, no time, I, I don't take it personally. I understand even the pressure that they were under, that is probably the best they can give. We are too obsessed of ever bigger targets, higher productivity, more, stronger, faster, higher. All of these have an opportunity cost as well. Um, we need the space and time to grow. Um, I don't think the current system has that. We only support in this area. Okay, thank you for your contributions. I'm now going to invite the speakers to sum up essentially, and they're going to have to try and do an impossible job in about a minute each. Yes. Um, on your point about teaching compassion, which has come up a lot, I mean, you, we could talk all day about how we would define compassion. And if it's from the heart, I agree that's a difficult thing to do. But there is a, a guy called Andy Bradley who runs an organisation called Frameworks for Change. He runs courses in building compassion. He's worked with Westminster Council this week. He's giving a TED talk next week. He's one of the Observer's 50 top radicals. Look him up, Frameworks for Change. He's getting very good results that are rippling out through the NHS and care systems. But more importantly, on um, this whole issue of pressure and so on, I've visited a number of very good hospitals in my search for answers to this. I was at three very good hospitals a couple of weeks ago. I think that a lot of the theory evaporates when you go into a good hospital or a good ward because you can instantly tell it's a good hospital. And you see nurses, I was at a social, I think they call it social enterprise in Bath the other day, where the nurses were sitting around holding the patient's hands. And you know, we need we need to provide care where nurses can hold patients' hands. I don't frankly swear, I don't care whether it's in the private sector or the public sector or a social enterprise or a social business or whether it's funded by shareholders, I don't care. I just want that to happen. And I think good leaders on wards and at hospitals and at the top of NHS trusts and at the top of the NHS, at the top of any of these organisations, can make it happen if they have the will to. Uh, okay, uh, very quickly. Um, I, I have to say nursing is not one thing uh, to respond to the, the colleague there, uh, but um, uh, we've lost our way with these higher roles. I think we need to continue to value fundamental care and many nurses are actively engaged in that, particularly in ITU and palliative care. But we also need uh, nurses to be engaged in uh, mental health, uh, working with various mental health interventions. We need nurses in health promotion. So we need advanced practitioners, but absolutely not at the detriment of fundamental care. I think that's <coughs> crucial what nursing is good at and what we need nurses for. Um, the other thing to pick up on the, the last uh, question is about the emotional cost care and emotional labour and I think we should not forget that and I think the values, I was at an event very quickly uh, not so long ago where a dignity uh, document was launched and the presenter was asked the question have you considered nurses dignity in any of this, the fact that many nurses go without meat breaks, it was about dignity and nutrition and the speaker said that's an interesting idea and my point is that the values we attach to patients should also apply to nursing and indeed everyone who works in the NHS and it's absolutely the board from the bedside to the boardroom and beyond. Thank you. Inevitably our discussion has assumed as as it were a single problem but we if we're going to address the problem we've got to separate as it were day-to-day -day thoughtlessness which is very unpleasant if you're vulnerable, active callousness sort of, sort of experience that Christina had and then active wickedness such as described in Winterbourne and they will not have the same source. They will have a different treatment and certainly we can learn from where things go well even under pressure and I'm thinking of the sort of pressure of looking after a ward of people who have severe cognitive impairment. That must be a huge and unremitting pressure. And most of us wouldn't actually take that on. And whereas we can be very cross about the lack of compassion amongst those who deliver that care, we know ourselves it isn't the job we would choose for ourselves. I think we've got to be, have some insight ourselves. 
And often compassion can be a term of sentimentality. Remember, it's only when compassion is tested in the context of repetition of difficult, of great pressure and so on, that you can really, uh, as it were, uh, take it seriously. And I think one of the ways we can't teach compassion, we perhaps can help people to cope with those circumstances in which compassion is likely to become depleted. We least, when we're trying to sort out what is going on, uh, generating these awful situations, we have got to think of cultures. The culture in the particular ward or clinic or wherever it's going on, the culture in the overall institution, the hospital, the culture in the professions, and the culture of society at large. And I would put it to you that when things go horribly wrong within medical care, it's a measure of what we are collectively as well as a measure of the performance of the individuals who behave so badly. Alfie, you've got the last word. Uh, well, okay. Um, no, you can't. Uh, you can't teach it. It won't happen spontaneously. But we can try and create conditions that foster it in the way that you've just outlined, Ray. And one of the other thing, the other thing to recognise is that the devaluing of nursing work and the devaluing of teachers' work is, I think, part of a wider cultural devaluing of human beings themselves, as I mentioned in, in, in my opening remarks. And I think that means, and part of that, uh, you know, these ide the idea that you can teach, you know, <coughs> an act of compassion is a unique thing. It's just uh, something that happens between one individual and another individual or a group of individuals. That, you know, it can be a hug, unless you're a carer and you've got a local authority saying you're not allowed to hug people, which is what happens where I come from. But the actual meaning of it, you know, it isn't in the technical thing, it's in that relationship, and it's the relational aspect and substance, the human relational aspect and substance, that I think is being corroded. And I'm sorry, Christina, but all your calls for any guru of frameworks or whatever that claims to teach compassion is, I think, just make, treating us as a guru a little better than Pavlov's dogs, really. Well, can I <laughs> thank our speakers and remind you that the Forest Bookshop is open and the ideas market on level on ground level is there as well. So you've got a bit of time to browse and reflect and think. We haven't obviously solved this problem, surprise, surprise. But I think our panel made a very good step at trying to look at it compassionately. Can I thank you?